Bibles, and you'd open them to Luke, the second chapter, beginning at verse 1, and we're going to read the first seven verses. <clears throat> And tonight I want to talk to us about the topic, we need to be in Bethlehem. We need to be in Bethlehem. Luke, the second chapter, beginning at verse 1, as we stand in honor of the reading of God's word, and the word of the Lord reads, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished, that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room. because there was no room in the inn. Master, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you for this time of year. Lord, when people look at this wondrous event, suddenly it changes hearts and changes attitudes, and people become something different than they are the rest of the year round. And God, we're just so grateful today that we're able to look beyond the glitter and the glitz of Christmas as a commercial holiday and we're able to appreciate this time of year as simply a time set aside to recognize the incarnation, the day that heaven and earth met, the day that humanity and divinity touched one another finger to finger. Master, today we pray that your anointing would rest upon me. You've given me such a marvelous message for this night. I pray, God, that you help me to deliver it. Lord, even stop the tears if you would, because I'll never get through this if I just cry my way through. But God, help us today, Jesus, to hear what the Spirit of the Lord would speak to the church. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated tonight. You know, we all remember the little childhood song, Mary Had a Little Lamb. A little lamb, a little lamb. Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. And you know, for those of us that are believers, we could almost construe that, at least the first verse of that song, we could construe that into a Christian tune and say, yes, Mary had a little lamb, a little lamb, a little lamb. Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. But you know, there was more to what Mary had, and there was more to why Mary had what she had, where she had it, that we often realize and then we often uh, really pay attention and think about. We sing songs like, Oh, Little Town of Bethlehem. And we hear songs like the song we played at first, Child of Bethlehem. And we hear mention of Bethlehem. But we don't really give a lot of credence. We don't give a lot of thought. We don't, you know really pay that much attention to why it was so imperative that the baby Jesus be born in Bethlehem. Had the government not instituted a tax, had Caesar Augustus not instituted a tax, the reality is that the Lord Jesus may very well have been born in the city of Nazareth, which is where he was later raised, and where uh, people attributed uh, his coming from. They, you ask anyone, they said he was from Nazareth because that's where he was raised. But that's not, interestingly enough, where he was born. You know, I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> when God needs to get us where we need to be, 
He has the ability to move heaven and earth. When God needs to get us where we need to be, honey, he's able to move government. God did what we thought Caesar Augustus did. God placed the notion in Caesar Augustus' mind that it's time to tax, it's time to take account of all the people that you rule. And God moved an entire world. Because not just Mary and Joseph were going to Bethlehem, but everybody throughout the known world that was under Roman rule was on the move, going to the place of their origin so that they could uh, be taxed. And God moved an entire world so that one little girl could be in the right place at the right time so that her destiny in life and so that what God had planned and, and what God had desired for her and designed for her from the beginning of creation could be realized. Sometimes we wonder, God, you're not moving fast enough. I, I'm wanting to do something different. Why aren't you doing it different? It's simple. Because God wants you in Bethlehem. Amen. He doesn't want you in Nazareth. He doesn't. Mary could have easily argued with Joseph. She could have easily argued with the authorities and said, Listen, I'm nine months pregnant. You think I'm going to get up on a mule? You think I'm going to get up on a camel and ride all the way to Bethlehem from here? No, I don't think so. But Mary didn't do that because there's nothing that acts as a greater motivator than a tax deadline. Am I telling the truth? Amen. A tax deadline as set forth by the government tends to motivate people. If you doubt what I'm saying, watch on I-35 down by the main post office on April 15th and just go down there and sit for a while and watch. I'm always there with booby, so I know that it's this way. If I happen to have found one of the world's greatest procrastinators myself, but you go down there, all of a sudden, everybody's motivated to move. All of a sudden, there's no more time. Got to get it done. Got to go. Got to go. Got to go. And there are lines of cars all the way up I-35 trying to get off the exit for the main post office to drop off their tax return so they can be stamped for the 15th and get in on time so as to avoid penalties and to avoid any surcharges and all these sorts of fun things, right? So you see, God was smart to have used a tax deadline as a motivator <laughs> to get Mary and Joseph to move. The Lord knows how to get people to move. He knows how to get us where we need to be, doesn't he? Amen. And you know, it's interesting that the Lord was born in this little town of Bethlehem, but why was it so imperative? Why was it so imperative that the Lord be born there? Why had prophecy long before told us that he would be born there? There's a prophecy in Micah, and I want you to listen as I read it, because I doubt I'm going to be able to stand up long enough to <laughs> comment on it. I want you to listen as I read this prophecy and hear what you hear the Word of God say. Micah 5, 1 and 2, verses 1 and 2. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of truth. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. This is a prophecy concerning Messiah. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. He couldn't have possibly been created because he was from everlasting. But I'll, t I, uh, 
Actually, there's a, well, by golly. Oh, there it is. I was going to say there was a there was a scripture that I was wanting to share with you, and I thought that was it, and I just realized that's not it. That that's a good one, but it's not the one I was wanting to mention. Bethlehem was far more than simply the city of Mary and Joseph's upbringing. It was also that place where David, the great king of Israel and shepherd over his father's flock, was born and raised as well. Gee, do you see any significance in Jesus being born in the city of David? A king, a shepherd over his father's flock. Can you see any significance in maybe why baby Jesus had to be in Bethlehem? Maybe why he had to be born in Bethlehem? Oh, but listen to this now. Psalm 132, verse 11. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. That means he will not fail to do what he said he's going to do. Of the fruit of thy body... Oh, my God, will I sit upon thy throne. <laughs> Whoa, glory. The Lord, the Lord. Guess what word that is in the Hebrew? Jehovah. Have sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. That God is not going to back out of this. He said, of the fruit of thy body, David, of the fruit of your loins, David, I will sit on thy throne. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Do you see why I preach this one God, Jesus' name, apostolic message? Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's all through the books. You can't miss it if you read. Bethlehem was not only the place of a great king and shepherd over his father's flock, but Bethlehem was also the place where a stranger named Ruth became part of the family of her mother-in-law, Naomi. It was in Bethlehem that Ruth met a man named Boaz, and they married, and she became part of the lineage of Christ. And the story of Ruth <laughs> is the perfect telling and ideal type of the concept of a kinsman redeemer. Is there any significance in Jesus being born in Bethlehem? Oh, yes, there is. <laughs> so much occurred in Bethlehem of such great significance. David, the great king, laid the foundations, as it were, for that city. And not only a great king, but first a shepherd over his father's flock. And then the story of Boaz and, and Ruth, as setting forth the concept of a kinsman redeemer. As a great kinsman redeemer would be born in Bethlehem. Hallelujah. Now, was the child born that day, born a lamb? Well, yes. The Bible said he was the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world. From the very beginning of time, his purpose and the plan for that child in this life was that he would live as the Lamb of God. He would become the perfect sacrifice. But let's see what Jesus said about himself. In John chapter 6, verses 32 through 51, it's kind of a long portion, but I'm going to read it. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. Then saith they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. 
He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me, and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. <clears throat> I, there's an inclusive sermon right there, but I'm not going to take time to preach it. But him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Thank God, amen. And he said, for I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Children, you and I are part of all that God has given him. We're part of that. And he said it's the will of God that he should lose nothing, but should raise it up on the last day. Amen. And then he goes on to say, And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not amongst yourselves, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Now listen to what Jesus is saying. He says, it is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. He hath seen, excuse me, every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Amen. Mary had a little lamb? No, maybe the song ought to sound like this. Mary had a loaf of bread, a loaf of bread, a loaf of bread. Mary had a loaf of bread, and Jesus was his name. He was, by his own account, the bread that came down from heaven. He said, and the bread, he specified very succinctly and very clearly. He said the bread was something specific. He said the bread, in verse number 51, the bread that I will give is my flesh. My flesh. If you heard last Christmas or a couple Christmases ago, you know I talked about the fact that the Lord took a robe of flesh and wrapped it around his divinity. 
and became the Son of God for the redemption of man. The Lord is saying that the bread that I will give you is my flesh. It's the humanity. It's the part of me that I have created for this purpose. It's the part of me that you can take. It's the part of me that you can destroy. It's the part of me that you can kill. It's the part of me that you can torture. So you couldn't touch the Spirit of God. But when he took on flesh, all of a sudden his nature was different. And all of a sudden that bread was able to experience things that God, as God, could never experience. And suddenly that bread was able to do things for us that we could never have done for ourselves. Because that bread could take the nails. It could take the spear. It was vulnerable. It was soft. It was able to be broken. I want to tell you tonight, the Word of God declares in Ephesians, excuse me, Romans chapter 8, verse 3, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16, for he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. I, there's a whole sermon in there I could preach, but I'm not going to tonight. There, that's a very, it's a beautiful portion of scripture, but uh, to, to really get into it, I'd wind up going off on a tangent, so I don't want to do that tonight. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 23. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Jesus can't possibly be someone different than Jehovah God, because according to the teachings even of Jehovah's Witnesses, God created his own angels. But this scripture tells us that everything that was created, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, visible and invisible, all things were created by him and for him, without exception. Now listen. And he is before all things. He is before all things, meaning what? He existed before anything existed. He is before all things. And by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, 
and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile things, all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. See, Jeff, I may not look holy and unblameable and unreprovable to you, but I do in my daddy's sight. Did you hear me now? It's not about how people see me. It's about how God sees me. But because of the cross, God sees me as holy and unblameable and unreprovable. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He says, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So Paul's saying you got to keep the faith. You, you can't be moved. You can't allow yourself to be, you know, people wonder, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Honey, you got to go to church to keep yourself settled. you got to go to church to keep your faith up. you got to go to church to keep your doctrine straight and keep yourself where you need to be. 1 Timothy 3.16, we've heard it so many times, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, meaning perfect in spirit. Seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now listen. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Paul's writing to the Hebrews and he's saying, now we can boldly go into the holy of holies. That place that once was behind the veil. That place that once was inaccessible to anyone except the high priest. He said, now we can boldly go in to the holiest, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, listen to this now, children, if you don't get goosebumps here, you're dead. Through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. What separated man from God and God from man? The flesh. And that's why Jesus Christ condemning sin in the flesh. And the veil was torn in two. Because the flesh <laughs> was no longer an obstacle. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> he says, And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed, and our bodies washed with pure water. There's an implication here, reference to baptism. Amen. You see? He thinks there's a purpose in that. It's symbolic in one sense, but at the same time, there's a genuine purpose. Having your body washed with pure water. Amen. <clears throat> My Lord, have mercy. The Lord declared himself to be the bread of life, and he declared that bread to be his flesh. Even at the Last Supper, he used this imagery in breaking the unleavened bread and declaring in Matthew 26 and verse 26, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to 
the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. See, really, Mary's little baby boy wouldn't look quite like this. He'd be a lot thinner. Because the bread that is used at the Passover is unleavened bread. And the visual aid I'm using tonight is leavened bread. But the Bible said he was made sin so that he could condemn sin in the flesh. And the bread that he took at the Last Supper would have been unleavened bread, which would mean in scriptural terms leaven or yeast is symbolic or representative of sin. But when that baby was born in the manger, it was born in unleavened bread. But on the cross, he took on all our leaven. Amen. He took on all our sin. All of it. Not some of it, not part of it. All of it. Amen. He said, this is my body. Take, eat. This is my body. His body was born in the manger. His soul had existed throughout time and eternity. Infinitum. The bread was born that glorious morning. Mary had a loaf of bread. And where better to give birth to a loaf of bread than in a city whose very name translates House of Bread. <laughs> Bethlehem means House of Bread. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> now, why would God see it so necessary that Jesus be born in Bethlehem because he was to be the bread of life and Bethlehem was the bakery, hallelujah, and he needed him to be born in the house of bread. The Lord God Jehovah had gone to great lengths to see that the Christ child was born in that specific place. Where better for bread to be brought into the world than in the house of bread or a bakery. God will move heaven and earth to see that his will is done. He moved the government that ruled the entire known world of biblical times to see that Mary and Joseph were motivated to be in their hometown, Bethlehem, at the time of Messiah's birth. No circumstance is incidental. No situation is unplanned. God has caused you to be where you are today because that is where he wants you. Amen. You hear me now? If you are to give birth to a loaf of bread, he wants you to do so in a house of bread. Amen. Understand today that the Lord's will for your life is being realized. It is being realized is being realized. If circumstances are forcing you to travel to Bethlehem, there's a simple reason. It's because there is great significance in your miracle being birthed at that location. Amen. Don't fight the Lord when we pray and pray for a different course or a different path, and circumstances consistently move us in a different direction, learn to accept and understand that this is happening because that is not where the Master wants you. He wants you in Bethlehem, not in Nazareth. We can try to reason ourselves into our will, uh, our own will for our lives, or we can accept the fact that our God is awesome. And his wisdom is past finding out and accept the path that he places before us. The road to Bethlehem was long. It was rugged and dusty, particularly for a woman who was just days away from giving birth to her first child. But that difficult journey was necessary if Mary was to have a loaf of bread. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Did you get something from that? 
praise the Lord. Mary had a loaf of bread, a loaf of bread, a loaf of bread. Mary had a loaf of bread, and Jesus was his name. Praise God. Amen. I hope you got something from that tonight. I was hoping I could get through it, because I, I just, I'm feeling that right down to my feet. When you realize the import, when you realize the impact, that, that, that not one ounce of that was unplanned. Every step of that right down to the last wire was planned by God. He knew what he was doing. When that town was called the House of Bread, God knew that many, many years later, Messiah would come, and it would be that town that he'd be born in. Amen. And just as a little point of trivia in closing the service tonight, i got to tell you, you know, we read the story that Mary and Joseph came to the city of David, to Bethlehem, and that they were not welcome at the inn because it was full. And we always think of the inn in terms of uh, a hotel, you know, that sort of a, an arrangement. But in reality, there are some translators who have said that really that word simply translates room. There was no room for them in the room. You see, they were from Bethlehem. That's where they came from. So obviously they would have family. Uh-huh. But everybody was coming into town. And you know when everybody comes into town, after a while you run out of space. So it was very common in those days that if you didn't have space in the house, you'd make space out in the stables. You'd make space out. Uh, often they would carve out little caves in the hillside, and they would put a fence across the front of it, and that's what they used as stables for their animals. And basically, that's where the Lord was born, in a little carved-out cave. Think for a moment. <laughs> that's where they put him in the end. Eat out of my feet, I tell you, oh, so glory to God, amen. <laughs> he started in a cave, and he ended in a cave. <laughs> Glory to God, and he come out of both of them. <laughs> Glory to God. But the first one they carried him out of, and the second one they carried him into. Hallelujah. And he walked out by himself. Glory to God. Amen. Isn't that exciting? Praise God. Amen. Just had to throw you a little bone. <laughs> a little inspiration of bone. Praise God. Amen. I'm so glad it's this time of year. I love to celebrate the birth of the Lord. It's such an exciting time. And uh, I, you know, presents and all that are wonderful and it's great and you better get me the right thing or else <laughs> I will be, I will be, okay, at J.C. Penny with a receipt in hand. <laughs> and, and I will be getting me an exchange, okay? But, <clears throat> no, those things are all well and good, but you know what? Oh, I wouldn't take nothing for what I'm feeling tonight, you know? Oh, just that that wonderful, just the, when truth hits you so profoundly and so beautifully. And uh, I think if, if we ever should memorize the verse, it ought to be Psalm 132, 11. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. He didn't say, I'll sit on my throne. No, he said, of the fruit of thy body, I will sit upon your throne. And he did. <laughs> and he does. Amen. He didn't. He did. He does. Amen. Stand up with me if you would. Told you tonight would be a little bit shorter a service, but I think it was a fairly inspirational one. Amen. Praise God, and we'll take the nails out of the Lord here. And hopefully we can eat that later <laughs> without needing tetanus shots. But, uh, but uh, you know me and my visual aids, I, I'm sorry that the folks that might hear this message by tape and on the Internet or what have you, I'm sorry they won't be able to have seen our little visual aid here. But uh, uh, hopefully they'll still get the impact of the message. Amen. 
Master God, we thank you tonight. We're just so grateful for this message. We're so grateful, God, once again for this time of year when we remember the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you yourself, God, revealed yourself to humanity in a way that had never been done before. The only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth, Lord, we're so grateful today that we know this truth. We're so grateful today that we know uh, the reality of who you are. We're so grateful today, God, that we understand why you did what you did, why you came as you came. Oh, God, today, we just ask, Lord, that you would help us to take this message home with us, God. Help us to meditate on it, think upon it. God, let the truths just sweep over our soul and help us, God, to a higher plane than we've ever before been. Master, today, grant all this, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' wonderful, glorious, precious name that the angels sing day to day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed this evening. Go in peace.